Good evening, uh, school committee member Tony Rodriguez, Ward 4. Um, welcome to the uh, subcommittee of the Safety, uh, Security, and Transportation uh, subcommittee. Today's date is Tuesday, August 23rd, and the time is 6 11 p.m. Um, before we start, we would like to establish a quorum. Uh, committee member Joyce Asak? Here. Uh, committee member Cynthia Rivas Mendez? Here. Thank you. Uh, welcome to welcome to, to uh, our safety um, and transportation subcommittee. Today we have uh, Lieutenant Jones um, and Dr. Murray, which will be giving us an update with our safety, uh, security, and transportation um, going into the new school year. Um, and also we have Superintendent Michael Thomas in attendance and uh, Deputy Superintendents, uh, Dr. Cobbs and Sharon Walder. Um, Lieutenant Jones, the floor is all yours and you could give us an update on uh, where we are with uh, our security and uh, measures that's gonna be uh, implemented um, coming into the school year. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are currently in the process of doing the ALICE training for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Um, the program is designed to give a person or group of people who may find themselves in a violent life-threatening situation some mental and physical tools that could play a vital role in their survival. The program is designed so that anybody can employ strategies, young, old, male, female, it does not matter. One does not have to be a police, military trained in the oh. Hello? Oh, I apologize. <laughs> so we're currently uh, uh, working to get the Alice program up and running. That's one of the things we're doing. Um, I could read the whole report to you, or we could just go over the acronym. I don't know, would you, what would you like me to do? So we can um, just give a history of, yeah. uh, so we've been doing, you know, stay in place, lockdown trainings for, oh, it's since I went down to um, Central since 2010. I mean, they were doing it before that, but it really started to pick up steam in 2010. Um, we had a grant from the federal government that had that brought Tobias on. Um, and at that time, the grant allowed us to, you know, do a lot of, st you know, full staff trainings with all our staff. Uh, it bought a lot of locks, radios, cameras. Uh, and since then, we've gotten more grants from the federal government. But uh, it's gone from like it shifts often how we're trained like we used to be trained um that you would lock down you know stay in place and then you would just hide and stay where you are uh to now the alice model which is you know the a stands for alert meaning that you need you know you're aware alert of what's going on um and you kind of if you can shout out uh, instructions to others um and as much as information as, as you can. Obviously, if you have a cell phone, you would call for help. Um, then lockdown, or they call it shelter in place, would, you would lock down um, and you would basically um, do anything you can if the intruder is outside the door to barricade. Um, and that's how we train now. Uh, and then inform would be uh, you give real time updates and uh, Lieutenant Jones, you can jump in about how the police would. Yeah, any real time data we're going to get, we're going to dispatch it to our. Is that coming over? Yep. Immediately, so our police officers have that information to get to that location. But the Alice thing is basically alert, lockdown, inform, counter, fight if you can, and evacuate if you have the opportunity. It's a new form of training. I know Nancy Lieber has been working on it, coordinating it, but uh, it's the, all, all, most of the schools in the country are using this model, I believe. From what I've been told, it's a good model alert lockdown inform counter and evacuate so if you, if you have to fight if you're close to the threat you fight if not if you're away from the threat you evacuate and that's the training there's training modules phase one all the faculty and staff have to get trained i think that's 87 percent complete but the latest data i know then phase two is they train the staff trains the students and then phase three is the actual drills so we're almost complete down with phase one Phase two, train the students. They have training uh, videos and modules. And then phase three is actual drills. So we're making good progress, I think. Yeah, so we still obviously um, 
all staff still follows their training as far as if there's a lot we have done lockdowns and stay in place for you know we've had issues in the neighborhood of a bank robbery and the police will call and say i have to put the kennedy school into a stay in place because there was a a uh, bank robbery in the neighborhood and the suspects are at large and they'll say whatever school they feel they're, neat, they're near, they would tell us to put a stay in place, meaning that all the action inside the school can continue um, as far as learning and passing from class to class, but as nobody can go outside for recess, um, no one can be dismissed, parents can't come in, in, you can't allow anybody into the building when you're in a stay in place. A lockdown is basically what we still train is that if if there's a threat inside the build out threats outside the building it's yeah. to stay in place threat inside the building then you go into pretty much your Alice training well you know you either lock down you evacuate if you can get out or you if you have to you have you know encounter and, and fight um, so these are that's the difference the way we used to be trained um, to lock down and hide and now it's if you feel it's safe to get your students out um, because the intruder might be at the other end of the building, then you just get out. And yeah, Especially, for example, a high school, the threat in one of the buildings and the other three could clear out pretty quickly, you know. So it's, I mean, obviously, this none of this is, it's nerve-wracking, obviously, and it's something, but we will... We will be having uh, and starting early, probably by the end of September, we will be doing a parent forum and providing them with Atlas um, training for parents uh, so they know what their, their children, what, what, they know what the staff is doing. This is all staff, not just teachers. Um, they know what they're, they're training for in school. They'll know the drills um, that the students will be going through. Um, they're all age appropriate because you know this you know people think when you do these drills there's somebody with a fake gun running through the school we do not do that that's you know that causes trauma and we would never do that that's ridiculous um, but there would be announcement like it would be an announcement that this is a drill and um, you know somebody is on the second floor or, and you know then they practice how to you know what you would do in those situations just so people are ready for real time. And then if I take people back, I wanna say it was five years, five or six years ago, we're the first di district that did the lockdown buckets from Lowe's and um, that has materials in the buckets to keep people safe in, in the building. Um, and then also use them if you have to break a window. Or we still have those in every classroom uh, and the teachers have access to those as well. And you know, we kind of make sure they're full and updated all the time. So, you know, it's something we did five years ago and ended up on CNN and all national news. So that's, those are still in place. I remember that. Thank you. Uh, I'll open up questions to our committee members, Mrs. Azak. Thank you. Um, so the Alice training, um, it's great. And thank you for clarifying, because I've had parents ask, what's the difference between a lockdown and a stay in place? So thank you for clarifying that for, for those that are watching. And as far as the ALICE training, um, we took the ALICE training. So it's all BPS employees, not just the teachers. Um, it's everyone, uh, which is great that we all get this knowledge that can help us. You just never know when you're gonna be in that situation. Now, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but over the years I've seen um, devices that you can actually jimmy in the door that will stop the doors from opening. Um, you know, there's so much, so many things that are out there. If there's something that um, we can maybe look into extra. Those are in the boxes, the um, the, the lockdown buckets. We have wedges okay. that are in there to yeah, help. I remember that. Yep. This was more like um, something to stop the door from, you put it right where the door opens and the top there's a metal piece. Um, and I just, I know I've seen it all over social yeah, we'll media and stuff. So it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to take a look See if it's something um, we can never, safety safety is number one. So if it's something we can maybe look into, try it out, see how it works. But, um, you know, the training, we can't have enough training. Nope. I agree. So, and, and, and actually, you know, doing the Alice training ourselves, we see what our, what our staff and our teachers are going through. So, um, no, thank you. So and then is the over Alice the next, yearly? over the last... The last probably four years, and with the support of the budget from the school committee, we've 
you notice that every school now has a security entrance, mm-hmm. which didn't have before. So you used to be able to go into a school, not all of them, only a few had it, but you would now you you get buzzed into a first area. You can do whatever business with the office if you just need to hand in a permission slip or, or, um, uh, or give leave your child if they forgot their lunch. So you have those security vestibules uh, where now if you buzz somebody in the building, they do not have access to the whole building. They, they have to be stopped right there. And if they have a meeting, then they would obviously plan meeting. They'd get buzzed in. But, you know, those things are all put in place as far as safety and security goes. So very important because, you know, they're fobbed and um, there's cameras in them as well and it buzzes to let people in. So have all our schools um, have them now? Because I know them. they're all perfect. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with the support of the school committee and the superintendent, you guys have helped the access control tremendously. But I was, and it's important to know, especially for people listening, and we'll, we'll talk about this with all the staff at the first meeting with them, is that I was reading the report came out of the Evaldi, the last shooting. They did the you know, investigative report, and it talked about you know what law enforcement could have done better and the issues. Uh, but it also said that... Um, the school like ours you know had all the safety and security measures in place the doors locked they had a buzz in system like we have a fob system um cameras uh and you know everything was there um but there was a culture of complacency um where staff were pegging doors open to run out to their car um, or going to get something and i think that's what we have to always remind ourselves that the safe, all the mechanisms that we've paid for, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously very important to have, but we have to make sure that we're always conscious of making sure doors are closed. Um, they're obviously locked, and you know, all visitors have to re- report to the main office, and you can't peg a door open if you're just running out quick to get a box or something you forgot. You need to, and we've spent a lot of money hundreds of thousand dollars on fobs and we fobbed pretty much almost every door where people so there's no reason to peg doors you come in with your id and fob your way back into the building so you know something we always have to remind ourselves thank you um cynthia do you have uh, any questions Hello? Oh, do you have any questions, Cynthia? No. All right, thank you. Um, Tony Jones, uh, you know, we had a lot of hiccups um, opening school with a lot of the, you know, small, I'll, I'll call them small incidents at the high school. Um, what measures have, you know, your department with school police, working with the security, what have you guys um, looked at to implement or get better at or where we had you know, some hiccups as um, far as, you know, checking the students coming in with their bags, using our metal detectors, and so forth. Well, with the support of the superintendent, you know, the, the new metal detectors that we have uh, exponentially the kids getting in quicker. I believe they hired about 12, I think 11 access control specialists to monitor the doors. Um, and I'm sure if we need security the first few weeks, we can use them. So we're going to have those doors covered, especially right at the beginning, to get the kids used to the program. We'll have someone at every door, from what I understand. Now, with the uh, access control um, staff, can you just break down as far as um, the level of training um, that they have to go through, um, you know, what to look for, and, you know, how, how is training implemented with these staff members? They're going to be trained, I believe, Friday by Officer uh, Benoit on the, the system, the what metal detector system, and what to look for and what have. As soon as they start the process getting hired, as soon as they start, we'll get them trained. And far as um, our um, school police, uh, can you just give a breakdown as far as, you know, what their day-to-day um, interactions are with the students and, you know, what they they actually do when they first, you know, arrive at the school? But just to give the public... Uh, some more information and knowledge of you know what our school police division actually do on a day-to-day basis. If they're not doing traffic, and what is the students actually, I want them to be out there and be friendly, you know, engaging the students in a positive manner, 
and building those relationships is what we want them doing. A lot of times in the morning they have to do traffic to help the buses and kids get in and out. And if they got to go to a call, but we want them out there being positive with the kids and building relationships. That's what we want. Thank you. Um, any other further questions? Uh, thank you, um, Lieutenant thank you, Jones. Uh, committee members. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Yeah, and I just want to thank Lieutenant Jones, uh, Sergeant Livingston, who couldn't be with us tonight for, you know, what they've brought to the leadership of school police. Um, you know, seeing them interact with um, the students at the high school. Uh, helping students with their prom dates, <laughs> um, just, you know, just be always being out in the cafeterias, the, in the, you know, the, the entire school police staff um, that have worked with kids for so many years and, um, you know, just the positive relationships. And that's the key to keeping school safe is making sure students have positive relationships with all adults uh, so they feel comfortable reporting things when their things aren't right. So that's... I always say that's the first that's the first line of defense to keep a school safe is the personal relationships that uh, students have somebody an adult in the building that they feel safe talking to and comfortable going to and I think you know the staff has done that throughout the schools and um, and with the help of school police and you have this you know those kind of relationships with students which is which is big and I just so Everybody knows about, you know, like Mr. Rodriguez brings up a good point about the safety of starting the school year. Uh, we will have police officers um, the first two weeks, especially at all of our high traffic schools, to uh, do traffic to help, um, especially at our busy streets and busier schools. Um, so we ask parents and uh, to be patient because a lot of most of these schools probably 80% of them were built as neighborhood schools and then not built for the volume of traffic that comes in and out of them. Uh, for example, the Kennedy was a, built as a neighborhood school and, you know, places like the Downey who, you know, they're, they're basically off the road and they have some walk-in paths. So, and they have small parking lots, uh, one way in, one way out. So they're very difficult when the volume of people that come to the school. So we ask people to be patient. Um, if you come into a school in the morning or in the afternoon, you're going to expect to be delayed 15 to 20 minutes. And um, it's just part of trying to keep everybody safe. But, you know, we just ask for people's patience, um, especially the first couple of weeks as everybody's learning. A lot of kids are learning a new school. You know, buses are rolling. People are trying to figure out how to drop off and pick up students. There's a perfect example, the George School, the big school that was shoved into a you know, none of us had anything to do with planning on where that school went. It was before our time, but, you know, a large school of 900s, you know, stuffed in a neighborhood and obviously very small parking lot. So it's not set up well for traffic. So it's frustrating. And believe me, I've been there several times. So we just ask people to be patient because at the end of the day, it's about the safety of our students, staff and parents. So everybody can get to school and leave and be safe. Ms. Hazak. Thank you. Um, I know I've, I brought this up in the past. Um, Brockton High, we're talking about traffic. Forest Ave, and we have a lot of new drivers. Uh, we have a lot of students. And I know in years past, I've always asked, the officers are usually there to get the buses through. And if they can just wait another like five or, or eight minutes to get a good group of the students out of there. Um, I know we've brought that up in the past for them to... Um, just stay a smidgen longer to get some of the traffic going because when they're coming around that corner on Forest Ave, it's dangerous. There's so many accidents until a lot of the students get, get familiar with it. Um, but I do know I've requested in years past um, from other other officers, and I know, I know they've always tried to stay if they could because I know they have to go to the other schools at times, but an extra five minutes standing there after the buses have left makes a big difference, and it does help with the traffic at Forest. So, uh, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Marciano Stadium. I know during the graduations we had um, our access control staff members. Um, man, are we are we going to be doing that? As far as any events, you know, as far as like our football games or any events. And using those metal detectors, the portable ones at the high school, like during our, you know, 
games that are going to be. I think it's a great idea. I think that'll be up to the superintendent and you guys' decision to do it. I think it's wonderful. I know it worked great at the graduation. There was no lines. I'm all for it. <laughs> Actually, how many pieces of those um, portable um, detectors do we have? Uh, you guys, I think nine total. Nine total. Yeah, I and think how we many? We used four at the graduation. Just four. And I that, you, that worked well. Yeah, it worked well. Yeah, that was. So that was that was you know one of my main concerns. You know, going there. You know, we have a lot of, um, you know, fan base and specifically you know uh, the students that come in there. You know, just to make sure that the uh, the environment is safe, uh, so kids can enjoy uh, you know their game there. So. But thank you, Lieutenant Jones, for your presence. I mean, if you have anything else to add that you might have uh, missed or we didn't ask uh, of you and um, what to look forward to uh, with you, you know, supervising the uh, school police division. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you guys for your support. Any questions, send me an email. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to call Dr. Murray, who will be here to give us a presentation on transportation. And give us an update. Uh -oh. Hello, Dr. Murray. Good evening. Thanks for coming. So, as you know, Cliff is assistant superintendent of transportation and um, this is the first year that we will um, have all our buses and vans as last year we started with vans and would we have 12 large buses ten. Ten. 10 buses so last year we had to depend obviously we still had a half a contract with first student for the large buses the first student was also doing our athletic transportation last year which uh, they missed a few <laughs> and you know they, the least so yeah, so um, now that's all with us. So again, thanks to the school committee and I wanna thank Dr. Murray because it's been a big undertaking, especially starting a transportation company in the middle of COVID and in the middle of a bus driver shortage as well. So he'll give you an update on uh, the hiring of the drivers, the training and uh, some real good things they're gonna be doing uh, next week to kind of get everybody used to their bus routes and um, just as make it as smooth as possible. So thank you, Cliff. Uh, good evening. So um, just to, to kind of recap the numbers to start, we have 62 large buses that we've received and had them, you know, inspected by the state, the DOT, and state inspections. They're thoroughly gone over by the uh, technicians here in Brockton as well to make sure that they're functioning properly and to safe for everybody. We've also got um, 66 we've received 66 microbuses, the vans uh, of those vehicles. Uh, one was involved in an accident uh, last um, winter and was uh, totaled and, and kind of washed out of service. We do have seven um, microbuses that are equipped for uh, wheelchair students. And uh, we have two that we're waiting for that are still in Canada and will not be available for September 2nd. Um, We've got 111 regular routes, uh, bus routes, and we have four wheelchair routes. Um, with the number of routes that we have, uh, we, have we really do have uh, the industry standard um, six spares for large buses in the event of a, some kind of mechanical failure or, or reason it has to go out of service for maintenance. Uh, we're a little tight with the vans. Um, again, we have two out, one was damaged. So uh, we still have spares. Uh, we'll have a spare for the wheelchair group as well. Um, drivers last year we had at the end of the year we had 81 drivers employed by the city of Brockton we've added 25 already and we have um, approximately another 15 kind of in various stages of certification um, the certification for a bus driver is, is far more complex than, than I understood it to be they don't just get to walk in and you know take a driver's driver's license test and uh, there's uh, drug tests, um, background checks. They have to do 60 hours of uh, skills and classroom work. So getting uh, new drivers um, ready to take that uh, state-administered test is time-consuming. Uh, fortunately for us, 
most of the drivers, basically exclusively all the drivers this year are experienced, a lot of them experienced with Brockton. And obviously, once school gets started, then we will open up um, additional time for additional classes where we can actually, we have a lot of applicants that had not uh, driven a bus, had not done any of that work, uh, who are interested. And so hopefully we'll be able to build that, that group of drivers uh, as the uh, fall progresses. Ideally, we'd like to have a significant number of spares. So in the event that we have the flu or we have a COVID return, uh, we, that won't Im impact our service to our students. So um, our training, we have a large group of about uh, tw uh, 25 uh, drivers that started on Monday, and they're actually going through four days of um, kind of remedial classwork in terms of safety. We've got them in three groups. They're, they're doing, uh, redoing safety training, defensive driving. We've got them uh, going to all of the schools uh, so that they're familiar with the, the way the schools operate, the entrances, the exits, you know, and the, the area itself. Uh, the, the routes that are driven by the drivers are created, uh, were just finalized actually today, and they'll do route pick uh, Thursday and Friday of this week, the drivers, and then again on Monday. After they pick their route, they actually are required to attend a mandatory mirror clinic, and then they will be doing uh, mandatory dry runs. Basically, a dry run is they know what their route is, they know what the stops are, and they actually go out on the road and... Uh, make that trip for drivers that are new to Brockton we're actually pairing them up with veterans so that they are familiar with the streets we've worked with uh, Dr. Cobbs so that we'll be aware of any kind of construction that's taking place if we have to reroute folks and then uh, next week kind of the same thing really uh, we've got some other activities our our opening day event on uh, Tuesday and then we're going to do a simulated first day of school on Thursday where uh, the dry runs, when they're on their own, they can kind of come in when it's convenient for their schedules. But this will be a mandatory uh, first morning where we will actually um, simulate the start of school. And this will allow us to see how the yard works with uh, all the buses in it. Um, and then the drivers have been instructed to make the stops as they would typically on a regular morning. And they'll wait a little bit because they won't be actually loading students. But especially for our younger students and families, they, they'll get an idea, a sense of um, when the bus will be there. Uh, the, the routes for the large buses have been posted on the website. The door-to-door uh, -door students, which we have uh, over 1,100 door-to-door students, they'll be given that information via uh, instant messenger, uh, text messaging, and so forth. And then on Monday, hopefully, they will get, all the students will get, their bus information in the backpack electronically as well. So the, the idea, again, is to create a, a large degree of comfort and familiarity with all our drivers and also to provide our uh, parents, especially, again, with the younger students, you know, an idea of where, where they're going to be. Uh, to address any issues in those first few days of school and really throughout the year, we've set up uh, with the principals a, a private number with an individual in the office um, and they, these folks will actually have real-time information. Our dispatchers will not be involved in taking any calls. And so should we have a delay or an issue with a bus and uh, principal calls, they'll be able to get virtually immediate feedback about where that bus is and what the delay is. Uh, something that was worked out with Dr. Cobbs and Jess Hodges and those folks last year, too, is a kind of a text message tree where if we determine early on, maybe a driver calls in sick, and it's going to take us a few minutes to get, get that spare uh, going that uh, parents will be notified in real time about delays. So I think there's a good plan in place from last year for some of these things and then being a little more proactive in terms of trying to get the drivers and get a feel for what we need to do um, in real time. Again, where it's all of our own equipment, that is going to make things an awful lot uh, smoother just because we, we have kind of a handle on everything. Thank you. Uh, I'll open up the floor to any questions by our members. Mrs. Azak? Um, it's more of a comment. So last year, we, we did hit some hiccups. I mean, that was expected. We, we started our own transportation company. So we learn, and it looks like we've learned. It didn't take us too long to, to you know, smooth things out. So, you know, fingers crossed. Wish you luck, um, you know, for the first day of school. And I think we're probably going to be in a lot better shape than we were last year because, 
you know, it was brand new last year. And even before we had our own transportation company, um, there's always hiccups the first couple of weeks of school. So just be patient with us. Reach out to your school. Reach out to the schools if there's issues or, you know, or reach out to us. Um, but really reach out to the schools directly if there's an issue, um, you know, and that you need help with. That would be really helpful. The schools are very familiar with the locations and the neighborhoods for the bus stops and also the timing of when the bus will probably be there. So if I were a parent and I was kind of curious, I think that would be my first call uh, would be to the school. And then again, if there's an issue, uh, each principal or the designee has an individual in the office that they can text a call. And we, we'll get back to them, you know, in real time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hazek. Uh, Cynthia, do you have any questions or concerns? Sure. Questions. So how long would new drivers be paired with veterans? They'll be driving on their own uh, once the year starts. And again, most of our drivers that we've hired, I think with the exception of maybe four or five, are already licensed drivers that have driven in other communities. But we're actually having them drive together just for familiarity's sake in Brockton. We'll have a few um, fairly new drivers, but again, they are actually going out on the road a kind of continuously between now and that first uh, Thursday morning. So I think there's a really, it's a very rigorous uh, training program. And again, we spent a lot of time this summer with those 60 hours, about 30 of which is actually driving in the community. So, so is the idea that the new drivers would be ready? I, be I believe that the, any of the driver that we put out there has definitely gone through a rigorous kind of uh, shakedown in terms of not only our uh, standards, but the state standards. We've also actually in all candor had some drivers who are experienced who have come and submitted all their paperwork and then we actually make them go for a road test with one of our trainers and there have been a couple of people that we have declined to hire. So we have standards here and again, our ultimate goal is to make sure that every student gets to school safely and the parents are not worried about the safety of their children. Can you explain a little bit more about the virtual app you mentioned? So we uh, currently are not using the virtual app. We, we had acquired um, an app through a vendor kind of late spring, late April. There is a lot of work that still needs to be done. I call it the back end, which is all the computer stuff. Uh, be, it has to kind of merge with Infinite Campus in order for it to have accurate information about the location of students. Then there's the front end or the hardware end, which is in each bus. And there are all kinds of different components and devices that have to be installed and then tested. So unfortunately, um, the, the project has, we, we really were very uh, certain that we wouldn't be ready for September. And so that's why it really hasn't been mentioned uh, too, too much. Uh, we're, I don't think where we want to be, but we're working out the kinks in terms of the, the computer stuff and making sure that we have every student's uh, location identified properly. Uh, the company is slowly installing the equipment in our vehicles. But again, the standards in terms of safety are uh, such that after every installation, that vehicle is then road tested and make sure that you know, brake light wire hasn't been nicked or uh, a switch damaged. And unfortunately, we've had some issues with installation. We're working with the vendor has been very cooperative uh, about kind of redoing some things and, and changing some things. So we're a ways off from that. I think once we get to a point where we feel comfortable to actually start testing it, our initial group we're hoping will be employees and students of the district because we, we don't want to kind of demonstrate any we don't want people to f feel like they're not getting an opportunity. And we really want to make sure that all of the promises that were made to us are actually fulfilled and that it works uh, to the superintendent's uh, specifications. He was very clear about his expectations for what we would be able to do when we purchase this new uh, system and uh, we're going to hold them to that. So that's also part of what, of what we're doing right now is kind of taking a pause and making sure that everything that was promised to us is being uh, being done. So it sounds like the app is more like a few. Well, we're, we're, you know, I think I spoke with Miss Azak about this a couple weeks ago. We would be really happy if we could start testing it around the holidays. Okay. But um, we, we just can't afford to rush this, you know, because of what it's going to provide for our families and students. We want to make sure that it works properly. 
Thank you. Just to piggyback off of Mrs. Mendez, are we able to track that ourselves where the buses are? Without Eventually that app will, well, we can actually use GPS now to see what the bus has done. There are cameras in the bus. Uh, the vendor that does the live camera work changed internet companies, and so we're having to update the SIM cards in the, the box in the vehicle, but we can still pull that unit if we have to to investigate if something's happened. But we can look at the GPS of the bus to see what its location was. We can monitor its speed, those kinds of things. We can do that already. The next generation, if you will, this, this uh, program, this app that we're looking at, will actually allow parents with the app to kind of see things in real time as well. And again, it's very complex, both you know from a technical standpoint and a back-end computer standpoint. So I think it will provide uh, a much more detailed um, accounting of where the bus is and, and times and so on and so forth. But, but right now, we, we don't have that capability with the current system, although if we have an issue or a question, we do have a lot of tools to investigate and to assure our parents if there's a concern about a bus that was going too fast or took a turn too sharp or somebody interacted in a negative fashion with the bus, we can get that information to Lieutenant Jones and, uh, you know, follow up. All right. Now, when you talk about the, uh, the cameras that's inside the buses, um, do you have the capability to actually see it in live time, or do you have to go back and play Some, it? Again, that's what we're updating with the, um, I, I, I'm going to, you know, it was, Com it was Comcast and it switched to Verizon or vice versa. And unfortunately, the the uh, control of the module that controls the cameras in the buses has to be taken out and this card replaced. A couple of the cards we've been given have not worked. And so actually we're working with uh, Anderson down in Rhode Island. They're sending some people up to help us this week in the beginning of next. Will we have every bus with a live camera feed uh, next week? No, I don't believe so. Um, it's a monumental task as you can imagine installing these cameras and then making sure that they work and that the, uh, that the, um, th the computer itself is functioning. We will eventually, and I think in fairly short order, once school starts, be able to finish that up. But regardless of seeing it live, we would be able to have a bus return from a run, pull that unit, get it right on a, a thing. So if we had a situation that we needed to kind of make a determination, we could even pull that bus in and, you know, uh, you use the rest of the day with one of the spares if it was something that was really critical. What's the storage time on the on the recording? Uh, that I honestly don't know. Sixty it's pretty, days. Sixty days. Yeah, it's, it's pretty extensive. We've been able to go back. Okay. Now, how are we with? I mean, I know we have all our buses and we're just waiting for a few. How are we with our schedule with our athletics department? Because you know, well, uh, as you know, we, we, we did some have hiccups. some misfires last year. Uh, we worked with uh, the AD up here, Kevin Cairo, really in the middle of the summer asking for his initial schedule. Uh, those uh, trips have all been put in the books, I believe, with the number of spare large buses, number of drivers we have. We don't foresee any, any problems. Uh, you know, it would be horrible bad luck if we had, you know, five buses taken out of service one day. But I, I, don't, I don't foresee that happening. So I think we're in really, really good shape to uh, assure everybody that our athletes will get to where they're supposed to be on time and, you know, safely. So. Thank you. Also, um, have we looked at our smaller private companies um, that we use specifically through our SPED department, trying to, you know, now that we have our transportation? So, um, <clears throat> probably one of our biggest expenses in that area would be students that are transported in wheelchair equipped uh, vehicles and there's some training that goes with that part of our orientation these past three days is every driver is going to be trained on how to properly uh, utilize the um, tools and provide a safe trip for a student in a wheelchair accessible vehicle uh, so we've been able to recapture four of those routes um, the number of students that go out of district either that are homeless or McKinney Vento is almost 600 uh, obviously, we do not have the resources for that right now. However, uh, Jen Briggs, Jen Perez, uh, Lisa Gunderway, all those folks up in the office, uh, Peggy Galvin, have been calling those families this summer to make sure that we have the proper address, 
you know, to uh, ascertain what their status is. And we are uh, being very aggressive in terms of uh, cost sharing with these other communities, which is something that perhaps hasn't been done quite as uh, forcefully as uh, we are this year. So uh, we're, it's not, we're not in a position yet to really uh, recapture a lot of that. We simply are um, kind of numbers wise with the vans right on the cusp. And again, it's because we have you know, over 1,100 students of our own that require door to door. And so as part of the creation of the route, we try to identify students that are in the same area, uh, but um, it, it requires a lot of planning and a lot of vehicles. One final question. Now, with our drivers, how do we handle our drivers that have, I'll, I'll call them hiccups, you know, little fender benders? So, you know, what's the, you know, the, uh, the procedure? discipline process, uh, HR is working with us to create and finish a handbook. But much like any other kind of discipline process in the district, that's handled by HR. Obviously, uh, that's an expense. And when you have to take a vehicle out of service, that's a problem for us. So uh, this is something, defensive driving, one of the training modules, and we are working with HR in terms of the discipline process. Typically, uh, discipline is handled in a, in a verbal kind of conversation uh, first. The second time, if it's um, an issue that was related or is accident related, safety related, that'll go right down to HR and it's documented that way. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if people are aware of is that before uh, every time uh, a bus is taken out, uh, drivers are required to do a pre-trip. Pre it's very extensive. They check the lights, the brakes, the horns. Uh, it's actually fairly impressive if you're there in the morning in the dark when they're all got the lights going and everything. But uh, one of the aspects of that is they're to inspect their vehicle for any kind of damage. And then should they return that vehicle and um, they do another inspection. And so that if uh, the next day or if another driver takes it and we see that something's happened, then these folks know they're held accountable. So there is some accountability there. Um, typically what would happen is if we saw a driver that was involved in an accident, we pull the video, we take a look at it, and we want to make sure that that person is adhered to the rules of the road, showed a good defensive driving practices. And if not, again, that's a conversation with HR, and typically they're given uh, paid uh, leave, if you will, but they're actually retrained. And we have them go back out on the skills course, and then they have to do another kind of proficiency ride with one of our two safety trainers. Thank you. Is there any, um, like, on-the-spot sobriety check, meaning like so a surprise the, check if anybody's under the influence? That, there's a thing called the clearinghouse. Everybody has to get a physical every year, and they also uh, initially to get a job here in Brockton have to pass a drug test. Uh, and then they, can, they are randomly tested throughout the year. So um, what will happen is we'll be notified that somebody is being tested and then they have that day to go to a couple of different locations to provide that test. All right, thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions? I just had a quick question. Um, Mr. Rodriguez and Mrs. Mendez pretty much um, covered a lot of my questions but going back to the training so we're, we're giving them their training their road training um, can you just let us know what kind of medical training that they give them in case of an emergency because we have had issues yep. over the years where a student might have some kind of a reaction or a seizure or just something so a couple of the training modules one is first aid CPR that they have to complete uh, they all have a, a first aid kit which is for kind of simple stuff uh, one of the other things is the protocol for if there is a situation, a medical emergency, it's always deferred to a higher authority. They'll dial 911, they'll contact us, we'll activate our emergency response, notify the superintendent's office, the deputies, and go from there. But that's all part of this three days. We have each day they cover kind of a variety of things in these uh, classrooms, and then we revisit this again on the 30th, uh, for about four and a half hours in the morning with everybody. So people that have been here uh, prior to this summer have already gone through this training, but it's kind of a refresher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Any closing? No, I just, again, thanks, Cliff. Um, We've got a great team. It's yep. uh, a lot of people working really hard this summer, and uh, it is really a, a daunting task. You know, we, we brought on another... Um, 65 vehicles getting them ready 
creating space for them in the parking lot <laughs> has been a challenge. But a lot of people working really hard and uh, a lot of support from uh, Colleen Prowler and HR and uh, Lisa Oliveira getting these folks through because, again, it's a really a cumbersome process. They really do a lot of uh, different kind of checks, not just quarry and fingerprints, but this if the drug testing. It's, uh, it's pretty comprehensive. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Um, you know, prior to getting here, I, you know, I'm glad to hear that, you know, we are fully staffed and not dealing with what we dealt with last year. Um, you know, watching the news today with, uh, I believe it was Framingham, they're down like 25 drivers. And well, they have a we're close. We're on the cusp. We had a few defections, but we've got um, kind of five people almost ready to pass, uh, some other people with permits, and then we will open up the full training uh, regiment once school starts. So I think we've got a lot of people that are really interested in being drivers and working for the Brockton Public Schools. It was just making sure that we had enough licensed folks and preferably with experience. And I think we've done that. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes uh, next Thursday. Thank you very much. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Right. Thank you. I'll let this time I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Properly, all in favor, raise. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>